Welcome to Horror Babble. Horror Babble's Vampires continues today with a mouth watering offering courtesy of Hugh B. Cave called The Brotherhood of Blood. This one was described by Weird Tales in its February 1932 edition as a sensational story of the undead, that of a beautiful vampire doomed to prey upon the living. And without further ado, The Brotherhood of Blood by Hugh B. Cave It is midnight as I write this. Listen. Even now the doleful chimes of the Old North Church, buried in the heart of this enormous city of mine, are tolling the funereal hour. In a little while, when the city thinks itself immune in sleep, deep cradled in the somber hours of night, I shall go forth from here on my horrible mission of blood. Every night it is the same, every night the same ghoulish orgy, every night the same mad thirst, and in a little while. But first, while there is yet time, let me tell you of my agony. Then you will understand, and sympathize, and suffer with me. I was twenty-six years old then. God alone knows how old I am now. The years frighten me, and I have deliberately forgotten them. But I was twenty-six when she came. They call me an author. Perhaps I was, and yet the words which I gave to the world were not, and could not be, the true thoughts which hovered in my mind. I had studied, studied things which the average man dares not even to consider. The occult. Life after death. Spiritualism, call it what you will. I had written about such things, but in guarded phrases, calculated to divulge only those elementary truths which laymen should be told. My name was well known, perhaps too well known. I can see it now, as it used to appear in the pages of the leading medical journals and magazines devoted to psychic investigation, by Paul Munn, authority on the supernatural. In those days I had few friends, none, in fact, who were in harmony with my work. One man I did know well, a medical student at the university in Cambridge. His name was Roger Thring. I can remember him now as he used to sit bolt upright in the huge chair in my lonely back bay apartment. He filled the chair with his enormous, loosely constructed frame. His face was angular, pointed to gaunt extremes. His eyes—ah, you will have cause to consider those eyes before I have finished. His eyes were eternally afire with a peculiar glittering life, which I could never fully comprehend. And you can honestly sit there, spilling your mad theories to the world, he used to accuse me in his rasping, deep-throated voice. Good Lord, man, this is the twentieth century, a scientific era of careful thought, not the time of werewolves and vampires. You're mad. And yet, for all his open condemnation, he did not dare to stand erect, with his face lifted, and deny the things I told him. That sinister gleam of his eyes, there was no denying the thoughts lurking behind it. On the surface, he was a sneering, indifferent doubter. But beneath the surface— where no man's eyes penetrated. He knew. He was there in my apartment when she came. That night is vivid even now. There we sat, enveloped in a haze of grey cigarette smoke. I was bent over the desk in the corner, hammering a typewriter. He lay sprawled in the great overstuffed chair, watching me critically, intently, as if he would have liked to continue the heated argument which had passed between us during the past hour. He had come in his usual unannounced manner, bringing with him an ancient newspaper clipping from some forgotten file in the university. Thrusting the thing into my hand, he had ordered me to read it. That clipping was of singular interest. 
It was a half-hearted account of the infamous vampire horror of the little half-buried village of West Surrey. You recall it? It was known luridly as the crime of eleven terrors, eleven pitiful victims, each with the same significant blood marks, were one after the other the prey of the unknown vampire who haunted that little village in the heart of an English moor. And then, when the eleventh victim had succumbed, Scotland Yard, with the assistance of the famous psychic investigator Sir Edmund Friel, discovered the vampire to be the same aged, seemingly innocent old woman who had acted as attendant nurse to the unfortunate victims. A ghastly affair. But Thring held the newspaper clipping up to me as a mere trick of journalism. He denounced it bitterly. "'What is a vampire, Mun?' he sneered. I did not answer him. I saw no use in continuing a futile debate on a subject in which we had nothing in common. "'Well?' he insisted. I swung around, facing him deliberately. "'A vampire?' I said, thoughtfully, choosing my words with extreme care, is a creature of living death, dependent upon human blood for its existence. From sunset to sunrise, during the hours of darkness, it is free to pursue its horrible blood quest. During the day, it must remain within the confines of its grave, dead, and yet alive. And how does it appear? he bantered as the usual skeletonic intruder, cowled in black, or perhaps as a mystic wraith without substance. "'In either of two forms,' I said coldly, angered by his twisted smile. "'As a bat, or in its natural human substance, in either shape it leaves the grave each night and seeks blood. It obtains its blood from the throats of its victims, leaving two significant wounds in the neck from which it has drawn life.' Its victims, after such a death, inherit the powers of their persecutor, and become vampires. Rot! Thring exclaimed. Utter sentimentality and imagination! I turned back to my typewriter, ignoring him. His words were not pleasant. I would have been glad to be rid of him. But he was persistent. He leaned forward in his chair and said critically, Suppose I wish to become a vampire man. How could I go about it? How does a man obtain life after death, or life in death? By study, I answered crisply. By delving into thoughts which men like you sneer at. By going so deeply into such things that he becomes possessed of inhuman powers. That ended our discussion. He could not conceive of such possibilities— and he laughed aloud at my statement. Bitterly resentful, I forced myself to continue the work before me. He, in turn, thrust a cigarette into his mouth and leaned back in his chair like a great, lazy animal. And then she came. The soft knock on the door panel, so suggestive that it seemed from the world beyond, startled me. I swung about, frowning at the intrusion. Visitors at this hour of night were not the kind of guests I wished to face. I went to the door slowly, hesitantly. My hand touched the latch nervously. Then I forced back the foolish fear that gripped me, and drew the barrier wide. And there I saw her for the first time, tall, slender, radiantly lovely as she stood in the half-light of the outer passage. "'You are Mr. Paul Mann?' she inquired quietly. "'I am,' I admitted. "'I am Margot Venie. "'It is unconventional, I suppose, calling upon you at this hour, "'but I have come because of your reputation. "'You are the one man in this great city who may be able to help me.' "'I would have answered her, but she caught sight then of Roger Thring. "'Her face whitened. She stepped back very abruptly, fearful, or at least so I thought, that he might have overheard her. "'I—I I am sorry,' she said quickly. "'I thought that you were alone, Mr. Munn. I—may I return later? Tomorrow, perhaps, when you are not occupied?' 
I nodded. At that particular moment I could not find a voice to answer her, for she had inadvertently stepped directly beneath the bracket lamp in the wall, and her utter beauty fascinated me, choking the words back into my throat. Then she went, and as I closed the door reluctantly, Roger Thrain glanced quizzically into my face and said dryly, "'Wants you to help her, eh? I didn't know you went in for that sort of thing, man. Better be careful.' And he laughed. God, how I remember that laugh, and the cruel, derisive hatred that was inherent in it. But I did not answer him. In fact, his words were driven mechanically into my mind, and I hardly heard them. Returning to the typewriter, I attempted to force myself once more into the work that confronted me. But the face of that girl blurred the lines of my manuscript. She seemed to be still in the room, still standing near me. Imagination, of course, and yet, in view of what has happened since that night, I do not know. She did not return, as she had promised. All during the following day I awaited her coming, restless, nervous, unable to work. At eleven in the evening I was still pacing automatically back and forth across the floor— when the doorbell rang. It was Roger Thring who stepped over the threshold. At first, he did not mention the peculiar affair of the previous night. He took his customary place in the big chair and talked idly about medical topics of casual interest. Then, bending forward suddenly, he demanded, Did she return, man? No, I said. I thought not, he muttered harshly. Not after she saw me here. I uh, used to know her. It was not so much the thing he said, as the complete bitterness with which he spoke that brought me about with a jerk, confronting him. You knew her? I said slowly. I knew her, he scowled. Think of the name, man. Margot Verney. Have I never mentioned it to you? No, and then I knew that he had. At least the inflection of it was vaguely familiar. Her story would interest you, he shrugged. Peculiar, man. Very peculiar, in view of what you were telling me last night, before she came. He looked up at me oddly. I did not realize the significance of that crafty look then, but now I know. The Verney family, he said, is as old as France. Yes? I tried to mask my eagerness. The Chateau Verny is still standing, abandoned, forty miles south of Paris. A hundred years before the Revolution, it was occupied by Armand Verny, noted for his occult research and communications with the spirit world. He was dragged from the Chateau by the peasants of the surrounding district when he was twenty-eight years old, and burned at the stake for witchcraft. I stared straight into Thring's angular face. If ever I noticed that unholy gleam in his strange eyes, it was at that moment. His eyes were wide open, staring, burning with a dead, phosphorescent glow. Never once did they flicker as he continued his story in that sibilant, half-hissing voice of his. After Armand Verny's execution, his daughter Regine lived alone in the chateau. She married a young count, gave birth to a son. In her twenty-eighth year, she was prostrated with a strange disease. The best physicians in the country could not cure her. She—what kind of disease? I said, very slowly. The symptoms, he said, sucking in his breath audibly, baffled all those who examined her. Two small red marks at the throat man and a continual loss of blood, while she slept. She confessed to horrible dreams. She told of a great bat which possessed her father's face, clawing at the window of her chamber every night, gaining admittance by forcing the shutters open with its claws, hovering over her. And she died. She died in her twenty-eighth year. And then I shuddered. Her son, Francois Vernille Roux, lived alone in the chateau. 
The Count would not remain. The horror of her death drove him away, drove him mad. The son, Francois, lived alone. Thrang looked steadily at me. At least, his eyes looked. The rest of his face was contorted with passion, malignant. Francois Vernie died when he was twenty-eight years of age, he said meaningly. He too left a son, and that son died at the age of twenty-eight. Each death was the same, the same crimson marks at the throat, the same loss of blood, the same madness. Thrang reached for a cigarette and held a match triumphantly to the end of it. His face, behind the sudden glare of that stick of wood, was horrible with exultation. Margot Vernie is the last of her line, he shrugged. Every direct descendant of Armand Vernie has died in the same ghastly way, at twenty-eight years of age. That is why the girl came here for help, man. She knows the inevitable end that awaits her. She knows that she cannot escape the judgment which Armand Verny has inflicted upon the family of Verny. Roger Thrang was right. Three weeks after those significant words had passed his lips, the girl came to my apartment. She repeated, almost word for word, the very fundamental facts that Thrang had disclosed to me. Other things she told me, too, but I see no need to repeat them here. You are the only man who knows the significance of my fate, she said to me, and her face was ghastly white as she said it. Is there no way to avert it, Mr. Mann? Is there no alternative? I talked with her for an eternity. The following night, and every night for the next four weeks, she came to me. During the hours of daylight, I delved frantically into research work, in an attempt to find an outlet from the dilemma which faced her. At night, alone with her, I learned bit by bit the details of her mad story, and listened to her pleas for assistance. Then came that fatal night. She sat close to me, talking in her habitually soft, persuasive voice. I have formed a plan— I said quietly. A, a plan, Paul? When the time comes, I shall prepare a sleeping chamber for you with but one window. I shall seal that window with a mark of the cross. It is the only way. She looked at me for a long while without speaking. Then she said, very slowly, You had better prepare the room, Paul, soon. You mean, I said suddenly, but I knew what she meant. I shall be twenty-eight tonight, at midnight. God forgive me that I did not keep her with me that night. I was already half in love with her. No, do not smile at that. You too, after looking into her face continually for four long weeks, sitting close to her, listening to the soft whisper of her voice, you too would have loved her. I would have given my work, my reputation, my very life for her. And yet I permitted her to walk out of my apartment that night, to the horror that awaited her. She came to me, the next evening. One glance at her, and I knew the terrible truth. I need not have asked the question that I did, but it came mechanically from my lips like a dead voice. It came. Yes, she said quietly. It came. She stood before me and untied the scarf from her neck, and there, in the centre of her white throat, I saw those infernal marks, two parallel slits of crimson, an eighth of an inch in length, horrible in their evil. It was a dream, she said, and yet I know that it was no dream, but a vivid reality— a gigantic bat with a woman's face, my mother's face, appeared suddenly at the window of my room. Its claws lifted the window. It circled over my bed as I lay there, staring at it in mute horror. Then it descended upon me, and I felt warm lips on my neck. 
a languid, wonderfully contented feeling came over me. I relaxed, and slept. And when you awoke, I said heavily, the mark of the vampire was here on my throat. I stared at her for a very long time without speaking. She did not move. She stood there by my desk, and a pitiful, yearning look came into her deep eyes. Then, of a sudden, I was gripped with the helplessness of the whole evil affair. I stormed about the room, screaming my curses to the walls, my face livid with hopeless rage, my hands clawing at anything within reach of them. I tore at my face. I seized the wooden smoking stand and broke it in my fingers, hurling the shattered pieces into a grinning, maddening picture of the creator which hung beside the door. Then I tripped, fell, sprawled headlong, and groped again to my feet, quivering as if some tropic fever had laid its cold hands upon me. There were tears in Margot's eyes as she came toward me and placed her hands on my arm. She would have spoken to comfort me. I crushed her against me, holding her until she cried out in pain. Merciful Christ! I cried, and the same words spurted from my lips over and over again, until the room echoed with the intensity of them. You love me, Paul? she said softly. Love you? I said hoarsely. Love you? God, Margo, is there no way? I love you too, she whispered wearily. But it is too late, Paul. The thing has visited me. I am a part of it. I— I can keep you away from it, I shouted. I can hide you, protect you, where the thing will never find you. She shook her head, smiling heavily. It is too late, Paul. It is never too late. God— the words sounded brave enough then. Since then I have learned better. The creature that was preying on her possessed the infernal powers of life and death, powers which no mortal could deny. I knew it well enough, even when I made that rash promise. I had studied those things long enough to know my own limitations against them. And yet I made the attempt, before I left her that night— I hung the sign of the cross about her lovely throat, over the crimson stain of the vampire. I locked and sealed the windows of my apartment, breathing a prayer of supplication at each barrier, as I made it secure, and then, holding her in my arms for a single unforgettable moment, I left her. The apartment above mine was occupied by a singular fellow, who had more than once called upon me to discuss my work. He, too, was a writer of sorts. We had a meagre something in common because of that. Therefore, when I climbed the stairs at a quarter to twelve that night, and requested that he allow me to remain with him until morning, he was not unwilling to accede to my request, though he glanced at me most curiously as I made it. However, he asked no questions— and I refrained from supplying any casual information to set his curiosity at rest. He would not have understood. All that night I remained awake, listening for signs of disturbance in the rooms below me. But I heard nothing, not so much as a whisper. And when daylight came, I descended the stairs with false hope in my heart. There was no answer to my knock. I waited a moment, thinking that she might be yet asleep. Then I rapped again on the panels. Then, when the silence persisted in haunting me, I fumbled frantically in my pockets for my spare key. I was afraid, terribly afraid. And she was lying there when I stumbled into the room. Like a creature already dead, she lay upon the bed, one white arm drooping to the floor. The silken comforter was thrown back, and the breast of her gown was torn open. Fresh blood gleamed upon those dread marks in her throat. I thought that she was dead. A sob choked in my throat as I 
dropped down beside her, peering into her colourless face. I clutched at her hand, and it was cold, stark cold. And then, unashamed of the tears that coursed down my cheeks, I lay across her still body, kissing her lips, kissing them as if it were the last time that I should ever see them. She opened her eyes. Her fingers tightened a little on my hand. She smiled, a pathetic, tired smile. It came, she whispered. I knew it would. I will not dwell longer on the death of the girl I loved. Enough to recount the simple facts. I brought doctors to her. No less than seven expert physicians attended her and consulted among themselves about her affliction. I told them my fears, but they were men of the world, not in sympathy with what I had to tell them. Loss of blood was their diagnosis, but they looked upon me as a man gone mad when I attempted to explain the loss of blood. There was a transfusion. My own blood went into her veins to keep her alive. For three nights she lived. Each of those nights I stood guard over her, never closing my eyes while darkness was upon us. And each night the thing came, clawing at the windows, slithering its horrible shape into the room where she lay. I did not know then how it gained admittance. Now, God help me, I know all the powers of that unholy clan. Its nocturnal creatures know no limits of space or confinement. And this thing that preyed upon the girl I loved, I refuse to describe it. You will know why I make such a refusal when I have finished. Twice I fought it, and found myself smothered by a ghastly shape of fog that left me helpless. Once I lay across her limp body with my hands covering her throat to keep the thing away from her, and I was hurled unmercifully to the floor with an unearthly, long-dead stench of decayed flesh in my nostrils. When I regained consciousness, the wounds in her throat were newly opened, and my own wrists were marked with the ragged stripes of raking claws. I realized after that that I could do nothing. The horror had gone beyond human power of prevention. The mark of the cross which I had given her, that was worse than useless. I knew that it was useless. Had she worn it on that very first night of all, before the thing had claimed her for its own, it might have protected her. But now that this infernal mark was upon her throat, even the questionable strength of the cross was nullified by its evil powers. There was nothing left, nothing that could be done. As a last resort, I called upon Roger Thring. He came, he examined her, he turned to me and said in a voice that was pregnant with unutterable malice, I can do nothing. If I could, I would not. And so he left me, alone with the girl who lay there, pale as a ghost, upon the bed. I knelt beside her. It was eight o'clock in the evening. Dusk was beginning to creep into the room. And she took my hand in hers, drawing me close so that she might speak to me. Promise me, Paul, she whispered. Anything, I said. In two years you will be twenty-eight, she said wearily. I shall be forced to return to you. It is not a thing that I can help. It is the curse of my family. I have no descendants. I am the last of my line. You are the one dearest to me. It is you to whom I must return. Promise me. She drew me very close to her, staring into my face with a look of supplication that made me cold, fearful. Promise me that when I return, you will fight against me, she entreated. You must wear the sign of the cross. Always, Paul, no matter how much I plead with you to remove it, promise me that you will not. I would rather join you, even in such a condition, I said bitterly, than remain here alone without you. No, Paul, forget me. Promise. 
I... I promise. And you will wear the cross always and never remove it? I will fight against you, I said sadly. Then I lost control. I flung myself beside her and embraced her. For hours we lay there together in utter silence. She died in my arms. It is hard to find words for the rest of this. It was hard, then, to find any reason for living. I did no work for months on end. The typewriter remained impassive upon its desk, forgotten, dusty, mocking me night after night as I paced the floor of my room. In time, I began to receive letters from editors, from prominent medical men, demanding to know why my articles had so suddenly ceased to appear in current periodicals. What could I say to them? Could I explain to them that when I sat down at the typewriter, her face held my fingers stiff? No, they would not have understood. They would have dubbed me a rank sentimentalist. I could not reply to their requests. I could only read their letters over and over again in desperation, and hurl the missives to the floor as a symbol of my defeat. I wanted to talk. God, how I wanted to! But I had no one to listen to me. Casual acquaintances I did not dare take into my confidence. Roger Threng did not return. Even the fellow in the rooms above me, who shared his apartment with me that night, did not come near me. He sensed that something peculiar, something beyond his scope of reason, enveloped me. Six months passed and I began, slowly at first, to return to my regular routine. That first return to work was agony. More than one thesis I started in the proper editorial manner, only to find myself, after the first half-dozen pages, writing about her, her words, her thoughts. More than once I wrenched pages from the roll of the typewriter, ripped them to shreds, and dashed them to the floor only to gather them together again and read them a hundred times more because they spoke of her. And so a year passed, a year of my allotted time of loneliness, before she should return. Three months more, and I was offered an instructorship at the university to lecture on philosophy. I accepted the position, and there I learned that Roger Thring had graduated from the medical school had hung out his private shingle and was well along the road to medical fame. Once, by sheer accident, I encountered him in the corridors of the university. He shook my hand, spoke to me for a few minutes regarding his success, and excused himself at the first opportunity. He did not mention her. Then, months later, came the night of my twenty-eighth birthday. That night I did a strange thing. When darkness had crept into my room, I drew the great chair close to one of the windows, flung the aperture open wide, and waited, waited, and hoped I wanted her to come. Yet I remembered my promise to her. Even as I lowered myself into the chair, I hung a crucifix about my throat and made the sign of the cross, then I sat stiff, rigid, staring into the black void before me. The hours dragged. My body became stiff, sore from lack of motion. My eyes were glued open, rimmed with black circles of anxiety. My hands clutched the arms of the chair, and never relaxed their intense grip. I heard the distant bell of the old north church tolling eleven o'clock, and later, hours and hours and hours later, it struck a single note to indicate the half-hour before midnight. Then, very suddenly, a black, bat-like shape was fluttering in the open window. It had substance, for I heard the dead impact of its great wings as they struck the ledge in front of me, and yet it had no substance, for I could discern the definite, 
unbroken shape of the window frame through its massive body, and I sat motionless, transfixed, staring. The thing swooped past me. I saw it strike the floor, heard it struggling erratically between the legs of the table. Then, in front of my eyes, it dissolved into a creature of mist, and another shape took form. I saw it rise out of the floor, saw it become tall and lithe and slender. And then, then she stood before me, radiantly beautiful. In that moment of amazement, I forgot my danger. I lurched up from the chair and took a sudden step toward her. My arms went out. Her arms were already out, and she was standing there waiting for me to take her. But even as I would have clasped her slender body, she fell away from me, staring in horror at the crucifix that hung from my throat. I stopped short. I spoke to her, calling her by name. But she retreated from me, circling around me until she stood before the open window. Then, with uncanny quickness, she was gone, and a great black-winged bat swirled through the opening into the outer darkness. For an eternity I stood absolutely still, with my arms still outstretched. Then— with a dry, helpless sob, I turned away. Need I repeat what must already be obvious? She returned. Night after night she returned to me, taking form before me with her lovely, pleading arms outstretched to enfold me. I could not bring myself to believe that this utterly lovely, supplicating figure could wish to do me harm. For that matter— I could not believe that she was dead, that she had ever died. I wanted her. God, how I wanted her. I would have given my life to take her beautiful body once more in my arms and hold her close to me. But I remembered my promise to her. The crucifix remained about my throat. Never once did she touch it, or touch me. In fact, never once did I see her for more than a single fleeting instant. She took birth before my eyes, stood motionless while I stumbled out of the chair and groped toward her, and then the awful power of the sign of the cross thrust her back. Always the same, one maddening moment, and hours upon hours of abject, empty loneliness that followed. I did no work. All day, every day, I waited in agony for the hour of her coming. Then— one day I sat by myself and thought. I reasoned with myself. I argued my personal desires against the truths which I knew to be insurmountable. And that night, when she stood before me, I tore the crucifix from my throat and hurled it through the open window. I took her in my arms. I embraced her. And I was glad, wonderfully glad, for the first time in more than two years. We clung to each other. She, too, was glad. I could see it in her face, in her eyes. Her lips trembled as they pressed mine. They were warm, hot, alive. I am not sure of all that happened. I do not want to be sure. Even as her slender body quivered in my arms, a slow stupor came over me. It was like sleep, but more— Oh, so much more desirous than mere slumber. I moved back. I was forced back to the great chair. I relaxed. Something warm and soft touched my throat. There was no pain, no agony. Life was drawn out of me. It was daylight when I awoke. The room was empty. The sunlight streamed through the open window— Something wet and sticky lay upon my throat. I reached up, touched it, and stared at my fingers dispassionately. They were stained with blood. I did not need to seize upon a mirror. The two telltale marks of the vampire were upon my neck. I knew it. She came the next night. Again we lay together, deliriously happy. 
I had no regrets. I felt her lips at my throat. Next morning, I lay helpless in the big chair, unable to move. My strength had been drawn from me. I had no power to rise. Far into the day, I remained in the same posture. When a knock came at my door, I could not stand up to admit the visitor. I could only turn my head listlessly, and murmur, Come in. It was the manager of the house who entered. He scuffed toward me, half apologetically, and stood there, looking down at me. "'I've been having complaints, sir,' he scowled, as if he did not like to deliver his message. "'The chap up above you has been kicking about the noises you makes down here a nights. It'll have to stop, sir. I don't like to be telling you, but the chap says as how he's seen you sitting all night long in front of your window, with the window wide open. He says he is you talking to someone down here late at night, sir. "'I'm very ill, Mr. Robel.' I said weakly. Will you call a doctor? He blinked at me. Then he must have seen that significant thing on my throat, for he bent suddenly over me, and said harshly, My God, sir, you are sick. He hurried out. Fifteen minutes later, he returned with a medical man whom I did not recognize. The fellow examined me, ordered me to bed, spent a long while peering at the mark on my neck, and finally went out, perplexed and scowling. When he came back, in an hour or so, he brought a more experienced physician with him. They did what they could for me, but they did not understand, nor did I undertake to supply them with information. They could not prevent the inevitable. That I knew. I did not want them to prevent it. And that night, as I lay alone, she came, as usual. Ten minutes before the luminous hands of the clock on the table beside me registered eleven o'clock, she came to my bed and leaned over me. She did not leave until daylight was but an hour distant. The next day was my last, and that day brought a man I had never expected to see again. It brought Roger Thring— I can see his face even now, as he paced across the room and stood beside my bed. It was repulsive with hate, masked with terrible triumph. His lips curled over his teeth as he spoke, and his eyes, those boring, glittering, living eyes, drilled their way into my tired brain as he glared into my face. You wonder why I have come, man? Why? I replied wearily. I was already close to eternity, and having him there beside me, feeling the hideous dynamic quality of his gaunt body, drew the last tongue of life out of me. She has been here, eh? He grinned, evilly. I did not answer. Even the word she coming from his lips was profanity. I came here to tell you something, man, he rasped, something that will comfort you on the journey you're about to take. Listen. He lowered himself into the great chair and hunched himself close, and I was forced to listen to his savage threat, because I could not lift my hand to silence him. I used to love Margot Verny, man, he said. I loved her as much as you do, but in a different way. She'd have none of me. Do you understand? She would have none of me. She despised me. She told me that she despised me. She! His massive hands clenched and unclenched, as if they would have twisted about my throat. His eyes flamed. Then she loved you, you with your thin common body and hoary brain. She refused me, with all I had to offer her, and accepted you. Now do you know why I've come here? You can do nothing now, I said heavily. It is too late. She is beyond your power. Then he laughed. God, that laugh! It echoed and re-echoed across the room, vibrating with fearful intensity. It lashed into my brain like fire, left me weak and limp upon the bed. And there I lay, 
staring after him as he strode out of the room. I never saw Roger Thring again. I wonder if you know the meaning of death. Listen, they carried me that evening to a strange place. I say they, but perhaps I should say he, for Roger Thring was the man who ordered the change of surroundings. As for myself, I was too close to unconsciousness to offer resistance. I know only that I was lifted from my bed by four strong arms, and placed upon a stretcher, and then I was carried out of my apartment to a private car which waited at the curb below. I bear no malice toward the two subordinates who performed this act. They were doing as they had been told to do. They were pawns of Roger Thring's evil mind. They made me as comfortable as possible in the rear section of the car. I heard the gears clash into place, then the leather cushion beneath me jerked abruptly, and the car droned away from the curb. I could discern my surroundings, and I took mental note of the route we followed, though I do not know that it matters particularly. I remembered crossing the Harvard Bridge above the Charles River, with innumerable twinkling lights showing their reflections in the quiet water below. Then we followed one of the central thoroughfares through a great square where the noise and harsh glare beat into my mind. And later, a long time later, the car came to a stop in the yards of the university. Once again I was placed upon a stretcher. Where they took me I do not know, except that we passed through a maze of endless corridors in the heart of one of the university's many buildings but the end of my journey lay in a small, dimly lighted room on one of the upper floors, and there I was lifted from the stretcher and placed upon a comfortable, brocaded divan. It was dusk then, and my two attendants set about making my comfort more complete. They spooned broth between my lips. They turned the light out of my eyes. They covered my prostrate body with a silken robe of some deep red colour. Why, I murmured, have you brought me here? It is Dr. Thring's order, sir, one of them said quietly. But I don't want— Dr. Thring fully understands the nature of your malady, sir, the attendant replied, silencing my protest. He has prepared this room to protect you. I studied the room then, had he not spoken in such a significant tone, I should probably never have given a thought to the enclosure, but the soft inflection of his words was enough to remove my indifference. As I have said, it was a small room. That in itself was not peculiar, but when I say that the walls were broken by only one window, you too will realize something sinister. The walls were low, forming a perfect square with the divan precisely in the centre. No hangings, no pictures or portraits of any kind adorn the walls themselves. They were utterly bare. I know now that they were not bare, but the infernal wires that extended across them were so nearly invisible that my blurred sight did not notice. One thing I shall never forget. When the attendants left me, after preparing me for the night— one of them said, deliberately, as if to console me, You will be guarded every moment of this night, sir. The wall facing you has been bored through with a spy hole. Dr. Thring, in the next room, asked me to inform you that he will remain at the spy hole all night, and will allow nothing to come near you. And then they left me alone. I knew that she would come. It was my last night on earth, and I was positive that she would see it through by my side, to give me courage. The strange room would not keep her away. She would be able to find me, no matter where they secreted me. I waited, lying limp on the divan with my face toward the window. The window was open. I thought then that the attendants had left it open by mistake, that they had overlooked it. I know now that it was left wide because of Roger Thring's command. 
An hour must have passed after they left me to myself. An hour of despair and emptiness for me. She did not come. I began to doubt, to be afraid. I knew that I should die soon, very soon, and I dreaded to enter the great unknown without her guidance. And so I waited and waited and waited, and never once took my eyes from the window, which was my only hope of relief. Then, it must have been nearly midnight, I heard the doleful howling of a dog, somewhere down in the yard below. I knew what it meant. I struggled up, propping myself on one elbow, staring eagerly. A moment later the faint square of moonlight which marked the window frame was suddenly blotted out. I saw a massive, winged shape silhouetted in the opening. For an instant it hovered there, flapping its great body. Then it swooped into the room where I lay. I saw again that uncanny transformation of spirit. The nocturnal spectre dissolved before my eyes and assumed shape again, rising into a tall, languid, divinely beautiful woman. And she stood there, smiling at me. All that night she remained by my side. She talked to me, in a voice that was no more than a faint whisper comforting me for the ordeal which I must soon undergo. She told me secrets of the grave, secrets which I may not repeat here, nor ever wish to repeat. Ah, but it was a relief from the loneliness and restlessness of my heart to have her there beside me, sitting so quietly, confidently, in the depths of the divan. I no longer dreaded the fate in store for me. It meant that I should be with her always— you who love, or ever have loved, with an all-consuming tenderness, you will understand. The hours passed all too quickly. I did not take account of them. I knew that she would leave when it was necessary for her to go. I knew the unfair limits that were imposed upon her very existence. Hers was a life of darkness, from sunset to sunrise. Unless she returned to the secrets of the grave before daylight crept upon us, her life would be consumed. The hour of parting drew near. I feared to think of it. With her close to me, holding my hand, I was at peace. But I knew that without her I should lapse again into an agony of doubt and fear. If I could have died then with her near me, I think I should have been contented. But it was not to be. She bent over to kiss me tenderly, and then rose from the divan. I must go back, beloved, she whispered. Stay a moment more, I begged. One moment. I dare not pull. She turned away. I watched her as if she were taking my very soul with her. She walked very softly, slowly to the window. I saw her look back at me, and she smiled. God, how I remember that last smile. It was meant to give me courage to put strength into my heart. And then she stepped to the window. Even as she moved that last step, the horrible thing happened. A monstrous, livid streamer of white light seared across the space in front of her. It blazed in her face like a rigid snake, hurling her back. There, engraved upon the wall, hung the sign of the cross, burning like a thing possessed of life. She staggered away from it. I saw the terror in her face as she ran to the opposite wall. Ten steps she took, and then that wall too shone livid with the cross. Two horrible wires transformed into writhing reality by some tremendous charge of electricity glowed before her. She sought frantically for a means of escape. Back and forth she turned. The sign of the cross confronted her on every side, hemming her in. There was no escape. The room was a veritable trap, a trap designed and executed by the infernally cunning mind of Roger Threng. I watched her in mute madness. Back and forth she went, screaming, sobbing her helplessness. 
I've watched a mouse in a wire cage do the same thing, but this... this was a thousand times more terrible. I called out to her. I attempted to rise from the divan and go to her, but weakness came over me, and I fell back, quivering. She realized then that it was the end. She fought to control herself, and she walked to the divan where I lay and knelt beside me. She did not speak. I think she had no voice at that moment. I held her close against me, my lips pressed into her hair. Like a very small, pitiful leaf, she trembled in my arms. And then, even as I held her, the first gleam of dawn slid across the floor of that ghastly room. She raised her head and looked into my face. Goodbye, Paul. I could not answer her. Something else answered. From the spy hole in the opposite wall of the room came a hoarse, triumphant cackle in Roger Thrang's malignant voice. The girl was dead, dead in my arms, and that uncouth voice from the wall screaming its derision brought madness to my heart. I lunged to my feet, fighting against the torture that drove through my body. I stumbled across the room. I reached the wall, found the spy hole with my frozen fingers, clawed at it, raged against it. And there, fighting to reach the man who had condemned me to an eternity of horror, I died. My story is finished. The chimes of the Old North Church have just told a single funereal note to usher in the hour. One o'clock. It is many, many years since that fateful night when I became a creature of the blood. I do not dare to remember the number of them. Between the hours of sunrise and sunset I cling to the earth of my grave, where I refuse to stay until I have avenged her. Then I shall write more, perhaps, pleading for your assistance that I may join her in the true death. A spike through the heart will do it. From sunset until sunrise, throughout the hours of night, I am as one of you. I breathe, I drink, occasionally, as at this moment, I write, so that I may speak her name again and see it before me. I have attended social functions, mingled with people. Only one precaution must I take, and that to avoid mirrors, since my Deathless body casts no reflection. Every night, every night, I have visited the great house where Roger Thrang lives. No, I have not yet avenged her. The monster is too cunning, too clever. The sign of the cross is always upon him to keep me from his throat. But sometime, sometime, he will forget. And then, ah, then... When it is done, I shall find a way to quit this horrible brotherhood. I shall die the real death, as she did, and I shall find her. If you enjoyed listening today, be sure to subscribe to the channel by hitting the red subscribe button below. After doing so, click the bell icon next to the subscribe button to receive new content notifications. If you'd like to support our work and receive exclusive perks, consider becoming a channel member by clicking the join button below. To support us in other ways, see the video description for links to our Bandcamp and Patreon pages our merch store over at Teespring, and further information relating to our releases on Audible, iTunes, and Spotify. And until next time.